Starting with the official opposition, Mr. El Gabra, for seven minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Ms. Keen, thank you for uh, coming here today. Uh, before I begin my questions, I would like to offer you my apology for the way the Conservative government has treated you. I don't personally know you, but from everything I've learned that is available in the public domain, I know that you have been a public and continue to be a, a dedicated and a committed public servant who is committed to her job and takes her responsibility extremely seriously. And for no other reason from what I could see but purely political reasons, unfortunately your name and reputation has been dragged through the mud by this Prime Minister. And it must have been horrifying for you and your family to watch it happen. So I just want to assure you that Prime Minister Stephen Harper, Minister Gary Lunn, do not speak for me as a member of Parliament. And I want to reiterate my apology. This is not how I believe dedicated public servants who've committed 20 years of their public life should be treated. And thank you again for being here. Now, as I understand it, you were fired the night before you were about to testify before this committee, late at night. Can you please elaborate on that? Can you tell the committee how it happened? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the question. I, um, well, of course, I was preparing for to come to the to the committee on the 16th, and very much looking forward to this. And uh, I was, um, I went um, uh, about eight o'clock. Um, uh, I went home, and the staff uh, were still putting some materials together, copies of the presentation, because I had a presentation to give to you then. And they received a call from PCO, wasn't clear which part of PCO, and they received a call saying that uh, something was coming over uh, for, the, for me and uh, to wait. So uh, my staff waited from uh, 8 o'clock uh, that night, um, constantly, of course, uh, as, as I was woke to do, I was checking what was happening, where was it from, what was it about, no question, nothing at all. And then about uh, 10 o'clock, um, the Secretary of the Commission was told that a package was coming from Patricia Hazard's office, which is senior personnel, I knew her, uh, and, uh, and that it arrived, and then uh, he was there and opened it up and read it, and then he made sure I had it. So it was kind of it would say that it was a difficult evening is what well, is uh, an understatement were you provided any justification for that firing thank you mr. chair for the question I actually have the letter in front of me uh, that I received it goes on uh, for a number of pages but it uh, it has a lot of whereases and uh, there's one whereas that is applicable, I believe, uh, to the question. Whereas the President of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission failed to take the necessary initiative to address the crisis in a timely fashion using the means at her disposal and failed to demonstrate the leadership expected by the Governor and Council. Um, that's the explanation I was given. It, can you uh, can you tell the committee where in the act does it specify that the commission or the president of the commission is responsible for the supply of isotope? Mr. Chair, as I spoke um, to this in my presentation, uh, the the uh, act, the Nuclear Safety and Control Act, is a, a new act. Um, for relative to many uh, le legislations of this type around the world, and it doesn't specify this in terms of the supply. We've had uh, we had opinions of what the act covered uh, by our legal services uh, bef sometime before. We've always examined the act uh, continuously, and independent counsel agreed. Uh, you'll recall that the legal services was removed from us uh, December 10th in the morning. So the commission, when I was there, uh, did not have um, the expert counsel it had to review that. But uh, it's never been used. Uh, for, it's never included supply of isotopes. I'd also, as I said, um, I think the directive uh, 
in, in implicitly by the need for the directive to be given to us, the government acknowledged that they were uh, adding a new factor to our mandate. In addition, uh, I've worked with this act for uh, seven years. I've done uh, hundreds of hearings on it. We have 2,500 licensees. 20, 220 of these are medical clinics that no one has ever raised the issue of supply of isotopes with us uh, in terms of a factor to be considered in their licensing. Um, do you know how financially dependent AECL is on the supply of isotope? No, uh, Mr. Chair, I, no, I have no understanding of that because um, meta, uh, economic factors are uh, not to be uh, included in the decision. The decisions of the, of the Commission are to be about health, safety and the protection of the environment. And that's what the legislation tells us to consider when we give a license, not what the cost would be to that facility uh, to put that in. Um, and if I could add, that was really an important factor when I handled the crises after 9-11, for example, because it was important for us to add extra security. So we, we absolutely um, cannot be looking at safety as balancing off with, with a price tag. And, and to that point, are you familiar or aware of any regulator responsible for the commercial success of the organizations that it regulates? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, I no, I do not know of any regulator of that type. And since I was the president of the Convention on Nuclear Safety, which included all the world's uh, uh, countries with, with safety organizations, I have a very good idea of what is uh, the international standard. And I was that, that president for three years. And by the way, before I ask the other question, is. It it's up to you, of course, but if you don't mind, we'd like you to table that letter uh, that the minister, I know it might be sensitive, so that's up to you, but if, if that's okay with you, we'd like to see it. Thank you, Mr. Uh, El Gabri. Your time is up.